How could you start smaller? All right, I'm gonna throw that question out to you again. How could you start smaller? If you don't take anything away from what I have to say today, I hope you walk away asking yourself this question. How can you start smaller? I'm Doc John, the Entre Professor. I teach here at the School of Entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneur. I actually spent over 20 years as a corporate entrepreneur in, this, in the technology industry. And what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna walk you through seven ways you can prototype an idea or create what's called a minimum viable product with very little money and spending very little time. And hopefully, miss out on some, some pitfalls that could really cause some problems. I'm also gonna go through, for, real briefly, four ways that you can test a minimum viable product when you have it. And if you stay to the end, I'm gonna show you a game-changing AI that you can never unsee. It will change the way you think about doing what you're trying to do today, which is creating business models and creating prototypes. So let's get into it. I wanna start out by telling the story of uh, David Bacchus. I met David about seven years ago, and he had just taken over a coffee shop. Now there's something interesting, there's a little hometown coffee shop, something interesting about this particular location. The coffee shop he took over was about to fail, and it was the third coffee shop to fail in that location in fi under five years. He didn't have to buy this business because the owners were so desperate to get out of it that they were willing to give him the business because he was willing to take it. He did something really interesting because when he started out, he started out with two carafes and a hot plate, okay? Two carafes, caffeinated coffee, decaffeinated coffee. The hot plate for making eggs, Canadian bacon, putting it on a bagel, right? That's how it started. Started really small. He could have even started smaller because he started out with brick and mortar so he started out with a location, even though it was a dilapidated location, it was hard to get in and out of. But he could have started even smaller than that. I saw another coffee business around the same time called Twin Valley Coffee, start with a card table and two crafts of coffee going to farmer's markets. They started even smaller. So what's happened in the last seven years is David's turned that dilapidated coffee shop into a location that ha always has a crowded parking lot. It's a seven-figure-a-year business, and it's always thriving. And when you walk in, it's absolutely beautiful. But that didn't happen overnight. It happened gradually. It happened iteratively. And in fact, there were times, there was one time where he decided to renovate the building. He saved a lot of money on demolition. You want to know how? He asked his customers to come in and help tear down the, the walls. And literally, it was an event, right? Okay, so what we have now is he's, he's launched six restaurants, a bakery, a coffee roaster, and several other supporting businesses actually working now on a tech uh, product within that. But this is somebody who started out as a social media consultant, saw an opportunity, started small, and built iteratively. So let's take a look at what this looks like. I'm gonna follow this idea, what's called the build, measure, learn loop. Um, I did a video on this recently on my YouTube channel called Learn the Loop, so if you want to uh, subscribe to my channel, shameless plug, there's a QR code. But Learn the Loop, the build, build Measure Learn is, uh, was really first talked about a lot in a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And a lot of you, if you've taken any of my classes, you probably have read it or you've at least heard me say you should read this. And the Build Measure Learn loop is basically saying let's build something, let's build it small, let's build it cheap, let's build it fast. And then let's test it. Let's get some customers looking at this and telling us something about it. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it, what is it? Oh, I love the question uh, Professor Sacco asked earlier. Is it aspirin? Is it candy? Is it a vitamin? Right? These are the kind of things you wanna, you wanna test your assumptions, like what he showed on the Business Model Canvas, so you can learn. And the more you learn, the better. Now there was a book called The Doer's Manifesto by um, a scholar named Louis Perez Brava. And the question there was, how do we learn a lot and pay a little for it? I call this non-linearity, if you want the fancy word for it. How do we learn a lot and pay a little for it? That's what minimum viable product is all about. So when we say minimum viable product, what are you talking about? Minimum, viable, and product. I gotta tell you, I don't think it has to be any one of those three things. 
Minimum means it just minimally has to do something. Or wait, wait, does it have to do something? Or can we say it could do something? So I don't know, minimal could be non-existent. Viable, viable just says it, it works. It actually does something, accomplishes something. But what if we could do lots of learning about an idea without it actually working? Maybe it doesn't even have to be viable. And a product, well, what does product mean? I mean, to me, a product is when you go into the store and you kind of pick up the box and say, I'm gonna buy the box, and you get what's in the box, right? Well, does it have to be that yet when you start to learn from that? So this is where even the term minimum viable product could be a bit of a misnomer. We've heard now 20 ideas today, and now we've seen them, started to see them kind of narrow down. Every one of these can be tested with a minimum viable product, and I'm here to tell you that all 10 of you can have a minimum viable product in the next 60 minutes and time to spare. And I'm gonna show you seven different ways, seven different approaches you can do with this. But before I do, I wanna talk about what happens when prototyping goes wrong. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Segway. Okay, more than I expected. So back in uh, 2006, I remember uh, leaving a little bit late for work one day because I was waiting for Good Morning America to show us what it was. For weeks, everyone was saying, it is about to be revealed. It is the greatest thing that's ever happened to humanity. It is gonna change our lives forever. Uh, forever. Sounds like AI, doesn't it? So we all sat in anticipation to see what it was. It was the Segway. The founder of Segway, Dean Kamen, was so concerned that someone would steal the idea that there was a cardinal rule. No one outside of the circle developing this can say anything to anybody. We will not talk to anyone, take any input from anyone. Over a billion dollars invested in product development for it, right? The segue. The thinking was that every human in the world would want a segue because it helped you get places faster. It would make things smoother and all these great things, right? They didn't count on a couple of things. Nobody really wanted one, right? I mean, it quickly became a joke. We've all seen Mall Cop and, you know, we've seen, you know, some tour companies have done some cool things with segways. Um, there was an attempt to use it in law enforcement things, but let's face it, you started to have these high profile crashes on these things. People started getting hurt. Ellen DeGeneres crashed while she was trying to show it to her audience. George W. Bush crashed on it while uh, on holiday. Several uh, athletes ran into photographers and like almost, the photographers were on these segues and like athletes in the play of the sport ran into them and you know, almost caused major injuries. So you have, this, uh, you have this problem of all of a sudden it got bad PR and no one was quite sure what to do with it. And in the words of Barbara Walters at the time that they revealed it, that's it, is that, is that really it? So a billion dollars, 140,000 were actually ever produced. The top MSRP pricing was about $5,000, so I'm being really generous in saying they maybe generated 700 million, but let's face it, I'm sure a lot of those were discounted, right? This was a failed attempt. Now, not a bad technology. Raise your hand if you have any kind of hoverboard type technology, scooter, one wheel, any of those kinds of things. Okay, actually fewer than I expected. Right? But point is, there's, there are now technologies today, they're using the same kinds of concepts that are making money, but in this case, they went so big that they, they got in front of the market. So this is why we do prototyping, this is why we do MVPs. So here's the first one, I'm gonna give you seven ways that you can prototype today. Um, first one is a napkin sketch. So by far the cheapest and easiest. Um, you probably can have at least one done before I'm done talking. Please don't. I, I think you'll probably find some of the others interesting as well. But a napkin sketch is where you take an idea and you write it on a napkin. You draw a picture, right? You have an example here of uh, Wise ERG, or Wise RG was founded in 2010. And this is an example of a napkin sketch. It was originally presented to some early stakeholders in this way. It's an image, it states what the problem is. There's this problem of food waste in the world and that's also contributing to other problems like, uh, like, like um, de degradation of, of soil nutrients. 
and um, you know, it's wasted cost, it's all these different things, right? So you have this problem, it talks about, well, here's the solution, restaurants can put their food waste um, into this box or into, you know, to whatever this, this kind of technology would be. And now we can analyze it. We can provide data that's useful to the restaurant or the grocery store to help them know what they should be ordering, when they should be ordering, how much, these kinds of things. But also we can, can fuel uh, information back to food companies about how to improve nutrition, all these kinds of things. So this is an example of there's a napkin sketch that's saying, here's a problem, we have a solution, and here's a transformed world that is different and better now because of our solution. They haven't built the box. They don't even know how they're gonna build the box, right? But this is an MVP. So the first way you could today in your workshop create an MVP is draw a napkin sketch. All right, here's number two, slideware. I love this one. Billions and billions of dollars of funds have been raised on slideware. What is slideware? Slideware is a slide that looks like software that exists that doesn't. Okay, it can take minutes to create side slideware. So this is an example you can see, and it's maybe a little bit small, so I'll walk you through it. But the first uh, step here, this, is a, this was an, uh, an app idea that someone had, um, it's going back decades now, it's called Ripple Q. And the idea was that we create a platform where people could text in context of work that they were doing, communicate with their peers, share files, comment on files, work collaboratively on files, maybe even uh, like jump into a call with them or jump onto a video with them. Oh, wait a minute, sounds familiar, right? Hasn't somebody already done this? Well, at the time it was still, they were still thinking that this could be a thing, except that you know, Slack already existed, so. But what happened was there was interest in this idea on the napkin sketch. Okay, this looks interesting. Let's spend some more time and money on it. Next was built a piece of slideware. And that actually set the stage for something a little bit further, which is more like a, a wireframe prototype. But in the middle here, we have something that looks like an app, looks just like Slack, right? It has the features, it has the, you know, an example, it looks like it's being used, basically mocked up on a slide. Um, if anyone's used Canva or Adobe Express lately, um, it's so easy, anybody can just jump in and create, create something really, really quickly. Or, um, like particularly with Adobe Express, you can just put in an AI prompt and it's like, here's what it's gonna look like, right? So your second, number two way that you can do this is by creating slideware. This is like mocking up what, you, what the software would look like and then showing it to people. All right, number three, landing pages. Landing pages are a great way to uh, present a minimum viable product of, of, of any kind. So standing at this podium in the fall, Max Miro came and spoke to us. And in a matter of minutes, with a group even bigger than this, crowdsourced an idea to create an app that families could use to figure out what everybody wanted for dinner. They could vote on ideas or they could have comments about it and they could rate the, uh, rate the idea that they wanted. And then generally just know what, what's for dinner, right? It, and so it was cleverly called, what's for dinner? And in the matter of a few minutes, created a landing page to say, are you interested? And so the idea would be you go and advertise this landing page that looks like the app, say, do you want more information? And what you're really trying to do is figure out, well, would somebody put their email address in and say, yeah, I want more information? Because what does that tell us? Well, if three people respond, that's not awesome. But if 30,000 people respond, that tells us, hmm, sounds like this app might be worth building. Well, in a few minutes beyond that, he went into a no-code app and he actually built the app in Glide um, so we could all pull it down on our phone from a QR code and actually try it out um, in the same session. So this is an example of using a landing page. This particular landing page that you're looking at here was one where I was challenging my students in the Build, Measure, Learn class, uh, which is where we do this um, and learn to do this in the fall. Um, I challenged everyone to create a landing page app, and of course, I try to, you know, to do my own challenges. So I thought, well, here's a problem. Philadelphia has this awesome startup scene, awesome entrepreneurship scene, except it's all spread out. And nobody knows how to find it or get, get to it, right? There's no centralized point. So I said, well, let's, I'm going to, for my prototype here, I'm going to create a landing page MVP starting with a directory that just tells everybody, here's links to all the sites that has stuff on it related to that. And guess what? People started signing up for that. I created a newsletter. Now people started signing up for the newsletter. It's not huge yet, but what's it telling me? There's people that are interested in being involved in entrepreneurship. I even had somebody reach out to me from 
out, out, like a thousand miles away, saying, hey, I'm moving to Philly. I'm really excited about this. I want to be part of, uh, I want to be part of the Philly startup scene. Okay, so that's a landing page. Um, you can use uh, apps like card.co to create a landing page. You can use Canva to create a landing page. Um, you can use Squarespace if you want to spend a little bit more time and a little bit of money on, on, on uh, landing pages. You can also even use apps that are just designed to kind of get people engaged, like ConvertKit, where you create like a simple landing page, because a landing page needs to really kind of reach a particular audience with a particular problem message to say, if you have this problem, you really need this. And then you need a call to action. What do you need to do to, to find the answer to this? In this case, it's, oh, oops, I lost my, in this case, it's just get exclusive access. Who is it excluded to? It's ex ex excluded to the people that push that button, but it's a call to action, right? Okay, so next one, number four is wireframes and workflows. So this is really where you're starting to give a little bit more detail than you would in a piece of slideware. A slideware just looks good, and it really becomes whatever you describe it to be. Whereas a wireframe is when you start to actually say, screen by screen, what do I need to app, an app to do if it's on my phone, if it's on my computer, if it's on my, on my tablet. And so there's uh, applications like Figma that are designed to do this. Um, in software companies, in the technology industry, you have um, a role called uh, product management. It's basically just code for corporate entrepreneur. This is somebody that has to go and talk to customers and say, what is the problem that you're just really aggravated by? And then they have to say, okay, what would be the aspirin for that particular problem? Like, what would be the pain reliever for that? And what would we have to do? And then they work with um, another role called product owner or business analyst, and they, they start to map out, like, screen by screen, how could we solve that problem? And they build a solution, test it with customers, make sure it works. And so this is an example of the kind of toolkit that you can use if you wanted to show, this is what our app's going to do. It doesn't exist yet, but we're going to actually map it out. We're going to mock it up in, with a tool like Figma. You can also now use tools like buzzy.buzz, which will let you do this with AI. So now with a short prompt, you can say, I would like to have an app that does this and this and this and this. It solves this problem. It's going to create value for these people. This is how it's going to transform the world. And in minutes, it will generate an app. You can export all the screens right out to Figma, and you can actually run that app right in their platform. Early stage, but once again, AI really changing the game in terms of things that used to be hard that now are easy or easier. Um, Zapier would be another good example. If you're creating a service business, if you're, if you're thinking, you know what, I want to start a business doing power washing. You know, Cody Sanchez has turned that into a $40 million business in, in Austin, right? So, you know, it's like boring businesses are actually can be very lucrative. Well, so what if you want to do that? We need a workflow. A workflow says, I'm going to deliver a service. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's going to be in a, in a certain order. And guess what? Platforms like Zapier let you automate all or most of those steps. And so now you can create a workflow and automation to do that as a prototype of your product, and you can show somebody that, that automation. All right, that's number four. Just a, another quick example here before I go on to the next one, uh, Priceline. Anybody ever use Priceline to buy a plane ticket or, okay, so we've got a couple people that have used it. Um, when this started out, it, it was an unknown founder. So Jay Walker was unknown pretty much to the world. Um, they had a major headache problem. Airlines wanted to get rid of these seats that they weren't selling, but they didn't want to lose the revenue on the ones they'd already sold, right? So there was a major headache problem that existed, and there were travelers who wanted to get inexpensive places, so it was like removing the headache of having to pay a lot for travel. And a Federation Starship captain, right? You find somebody that's got a massive following that can promote the idea, and now all of a sudden uh, you can bring a message very quickly to a lot of people. And this is where even, you know, I think, I think a lot of times um, social media and a lot of people that are influencers or even just, even just have fun with social media and have a lot of followers, like a lot of times that's dismissed as just um, a time waster. It's not. If you have the ability to talk to a large group of people and present an idea to them and get feedback from them, that's MVP right there. And you're able to get real feedback right away. So just another example. All right, number five, no code app builders. So I have several listed here. I've used a Jotform and Glide a lot. I really like them. They're quick. They're easy. Um, there's um, an app which I, uh, I'm not going to be able to very easily show here, but um, I created one where someone said um, to me recently, it was, it was uh, my, one of my siblings, oh, I, I made a movie recommendation, because a lot of times I do these shorts on founders and film. And uh, I, I said, oh, this is a great movie. You should see it. 
They said, oh, I just wish I had an app or some place where I could put that information, like not just movies, but books and music and just all that in one, one spot. So what I did was I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting challenge. Let's try that out. So in Glide, in about half an hour, created an app called LifeQ. And with LifeQ, it's like just open it up and like, okay, here's all the movies. I can add a movie. I can recommend it to someone. I can have them recommend it to me. It's just a Google Sheet with a, with a user interface, right? Take a very short period of time. Jot form, you can do all kinds of things like that. You can't, probably can't see here, but the example here was just a challenge I gave to the Build Manager Learn class. Like, how could we create an app that really quickly uh, splits the bill between a lot of people or figures out the tip or those kinds of things? Those, exact, those apps already exist. That's a kind of a solved problem. But the idea was let's, let's try to do something simple like this with something. And using uh, Jot form, uh, we're able to build several different ways that you could compute that. So that's just another example. And you've, I'm sure you've heard of Bubble and Airtable. Um, Adalo is one that's very popular because not only can you build the app, you can also deploy the app right from the same platform. So you go right to the app store, those kinds of things. And of course, um, many of you are familiar with Graphite GTC, and we work with them a lot here at the Close School because they give you not only the ability to um, use no code to create the app you want, but then they use AI to generate the code base in whatever code base you need to deploy it, wherever it is that you need to deploy it. Um, these are game-changing technologies. In the past, you could not even get a prototype of an app out the door if you didn't have an experienced coder, developer, engineer to help you do it. And you may still, you're probably still gonna need that when you go to commercially make something like this available. But if you want to create a prototype, if you want to create a minimum viable product that you can show people and get feedback on, this can be a great way to do it. A little more involvement of time as some of the previous ones, uh, but you can have some really great versions of your prototype. All right, number six, uh, 3D imaging and AI-generated images. So I'm showing you three examples here that are like hugely powerful examples. Um, and uh, you know, so many ways that we can mock something up, right? Simple prompt into ChatGPT with Dolly activated, and I have this, this image of a, of a kind of a, an electric hovering, you know, transportation vehicle that can take us anywhere. Um, took me about 11 seconds to write this prompt, and there it was. All right, so another one, if you've been watching this week, has been very exciting. Um, OpenAI has announced, they haven't launched, but announced Sora. Now you can put a simple prompt in and you can have a movie generated with whatever kind of image you want. And it can be real humans, it can be real locations. Um, there's a, a, a screenshot or there's a, a view of uh, kind of flying over Santorini that looks exactly like it was when I was there a couple of years ago. Um, just as another example, people, animals, anything like that, and it can be animated or real. So this is where we're gonna see where you can mock up your product, like we have the dog with the selfie cam you can mock up the product and create a movie and have it run as a way to test it out an idea and see if people react to it or say, is this something you would want? Okay, let's talk about 3D rendering, 3D imaging. Um, this is an image, this is a product uh, rendering done by Lenica Digital. Liam Halsey is in the house, so uh, he, the artist is here. But this is a company said, hey, I need to be able to show my product, but it doesn't exist yet. With well, a 3D rendering, it looks like it exists, and you can see exactly what it does, how it looks, what's unique about it. And so this can be another way to do it. You can create an image, and even a moving image or, or a, an action image of a product that doesn't exist yet, and again, you can get customer feedback. So just some examples there of using 3D imaging or AI-generated imaging uh, for prototyping or MVPs. And here's number seven. This is tangible modeling. Now, if you have a product where you're gonna manufacture it, if you're gonna actually build a physical product, tangible modeling can be really, really helpful. Why? Really expensive to manufacture stuff. And if you get it wrong, you make one little mistake, it can cost thousands or tens of thousands or millions of dollars if you get it wrong. So if you do a physical prototype, you can test it, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can make sure that it is exactly what you want before you hit the button that commits you to long-term and heavy-duty expenses. So we have an example here of like 3D printing. Any kind of tangible product at this point can more or less be, be printed using 3D. Now, the material may not be right for the, for the product that you're gonna bring to market, but you can, you can create that first prototype. We heard today Joe talking about Quest, uh, of the, um, not Quest, sorry, Vision. 
from Apple, right? Everyone is excited about this, you know, the ability to do, um, you know, to, to have VR at like this whole next level. Anybody ever heard of Google Cardboard? Yeah, we got some people in the house that have seen it. This is a $5 piece of cardboard. You kind of do like the punch out the holes and fold it all together, and you put an app on, you put your phone in it, and now you've got a, a VR viewer. Very, very cheap. Not a great customer experience, I'm here to tell you, but it gives you that same idea. You can prototype an idea with something that simple. And then you can iterate forward. You can build on the things that work. You invest on the things, only the things uh, that matter. Um, Jeff Sheldon, uh, an example I'll give more about, but if you look at that video for a few seconds, you see it started with a sketch and went to clay and it went to 3D imaging and then it came to wood and, and all of the different things of the gather um, came together through these physical models. Um, print, Printful is a one you can do like a t-shirt. The first build, measure, learn t-shirt, which you'll probably see me wear sometimes in class, um, where you know, I, all I did was create a logo in Canva and now it's on a t-shirt because you can just go right to the, the company and they'll, pr they'll print it out for you and you can sell it on things like Gumroad. All right, so then the um, next one here is the example of this is a, a, a rendering of the, um, the first prototype of the Blackberry. Most of us don't remember those anymore, but when it first started out, it was amazing technology because nobody had the ability to do um, handheld emailing. And so they had a prototype like that that was tangible modeling. All right, so um, just about to wrap up, so just a story here. So Jeff Sheldon is a designer by trade and an entrepreneur by accident. Literally the original accidental entrepreneur. And if you've heard me say I like to help accidental entrepreneurs to launch, grow, and thrive. But with the Gather, which is a desk organizer, the concept came up, spent three years um, prototyping, sketching and prototyping and testing, finally came up with a product, and he created one. The minimum viable product was, a, was a, a version of the product that looked exactly like he envisioned the final one, but not ready for mass production. So what do you do in that situation? It's like you dump, usually you dump hundreds of thousands of dollars into production, you build them, and then you go out and hope you can sell them. He did it another way. He went to Kickstarter. He created a video, and he talked about how hard it is to get all his stuff organized on his desk the way he wanted to. He's a master storyteller. Well, what happened? He went from being a t-shirt designer into this tangible products area. He said, I need $18,000 to create the die so I can manufacture these things. Put that on Kickstarter. 60 days later, not only had he taken in 2,600 pre-orders for the product, he also raised $430,000. So guess what? He didn't pay to manufacture his first round of products. The first customers did. If any of you have ordered a Cybertruck, guess what? You just did the same thing, right? Testing the product before it's built. That's the idea. All right, so um, re real quick, four ways you can test your prototype. And this is uh, getting into a little bit. Once you have this prototype all along the way, you want to test this. You can, get, you can do it through conversations, this is interviews, focus groups. You can do it through engagement. The best kind are observations. You watch somebody have the problem, then you watch them try their solution, and you see if it worked, right? Um, and reactions, surveys, reactions. Social media, if you have a good following, can be really, really effective at giving you an idea of reactions. Um, if you haven't met Paige D'Angelo, just, just graduated uh, from Drexel, um, has a minor in entrepreneurship from, from the closed school, um, set up over at the Proving Ground right now, um, selling some of the only versions of the startup kit to the sustainable mascara product that she's created as her first product, but presently taking pre-orders and using her hundreds of thousands of social media followers to tell her story, to get their reaction, to see if the market is ready for the product as it is or if it needs to be changed. There's a certain point where it gets, she's going for a certain number of pre-orders at which point she can produce the product and it's already, uh, already at the break-even point. So another one is just formal hypothesis testing. So things like I've talked about with Kickstarter, pre-orders, mock orders, you can test hypotheses, you can test those assumptions and make sure they're right. And free trials, you can do a try before you buy and then pre-orders or I'm sorry, uh, click-throughs, your click-through rate tells you, is it working, are people interested? All right, I'll talk about, uh, if anyone wants to catch me later, I'll tell you why it's interesting to, uh, to talk about uh, Angry Birds. But I'm gonna leave you with this one. Uh, this is Go Zigzag. This is an AI that will fundamentally change the way you think about business modeling, customer development, and building uh, customer assumption testing. 
So um, this, and I'll, I have an image here. It's a little bit hard to see because we can't do it live. But um, essentially what you do is you put a prompt in. So you see up at the top, I have a one paragraph prompt that tells the kind of business I want to create. And in under two minutes, it will generate a, a validation plan. It will generate like a business, a lean canvas, a business model canvas. It will give you um, several different ways that you can test your assumptions, everything from customer interview protocols, surveys you should conduct, landing pages you should create, you could create. It's giving you essentially a roadmap to building out your business. For those of us who've been business model canvassing for the last decade, like 10, 12 years ago, we would spend days doing business model canvases. Now we'll maybe spend half an hour. With this, you can do it in minutes, and then you can start to edit from where it starts. So AI is changing the game for entrepreneurs in many, many ways. So that's all I have for this. Uh, my last shameless plug, if you wanna, wanna check out my YouTube channel, I have a lot of content like this on it. Um, for the workshop portion, you're gonna be working with your team to come up with a minimum viable product. I just gave you seven ways that you can do that while you're sitting in this room um, and you have everything you need to do that.